The objective today is to be able to differentiate between the many network switches that exist. So in this lesson, we're basically going to have two parts. The first part, I'll just define a switch. I'll show you my switch I have at home. I'll talk about the purpose of a switch and then its strengths. In the second half, we'll go over the difference between switches and similar pieces of hardware. Then we'll go over many of the possibilities that switches have. Then we'll go over the purpose of those possibilities and thus finish with a security connection because this is a cybersecurity lesson at the end of the day. So this is a switch. Your first think right share is have you ever seen one before? <laughs> if it's a simple no, that's fine. But if yes, I'm curious if you can remember um, where you saw one at. Now what a switch does is it connects devices on a computer network by using packet switching to receive, process, and forward data to the destination device. So it's not just a dumb box that will help two pieces or two wires connect, but once data comes into this box, it will process that data and then forward it to wherever it's supposed to go. It needs to process it in order to know where to forward it. Now, does that remind you of anything we've studied before? A network switch is a multi-port network bridge that uses hardware addresses to process and forward data, typically at the data link layer of the OSI, OSI model. And notice I say hardware address. What's the opposite or the brother of a hardware address? That would be an IP address. So the switch is looking at the MAC address and below is the switch that I have at my house, and I'm saying here that I have a pretty baby network, but this is the exact switch I'm using at home. Some switches can process data at the network layer, which is a layer 3, but, but if it's on this layer, it's additionally incorporating the router functionality, so thus some switches can also be routers. Such switches are commonly known as layer 3 switches or multi-layer switches. If we go back here, when I say I'm using this switch, I'm saying I'm using a layer 2 switch. My router at home is a separate piece of hardware than my switch. I wonder if that's where they came up with the name Twitch from. Not because people twitch when they play video games because they're under so much stress or something and it's fun to watch them while they're playing their game, but maybe there's some sort of connection there with uh, the concept of switches. I don't know. Now, switches for Ethernet are the most common form of a network switch, unlike the advanced, unlike the less advanced repeater hubs that we've talked about before. Um, these broadcast the same data out of each of its ports and let the devices decide what data they need. So there's no real personalized forwarding that's going on. It's just sending the same data to every computer, and if the computer doesn't need the data or the data doesn't belong to that particular computer, then it just ignores it. But a network switch forwards data only to the devices that need it. So it does sound a little more efficient, and I bet energy saving to do it that way. So a switch is more intelligent than an Ethernet hub, which simply retransmits packets out of every port of the hub, except, obviously, the port which the packet was received in the first place. These hubs are unable to distinguish between the different recipients and achieving an overall lower network efficiency. So a switch plays an integral role in most modern Ethernet LANs or local area networks. If you don't have a switch in your LAN, I don't know what you're doing. And I think I had a great example in a lesson before where I compared a hub, a switch, and a router to people at a party. So you can pause and read this to refresh your memory if you'd like. So I just really went over what the difference between a switch and a hub is. Now I want you to make a logical inference here and tell me what the difference between a router and a switch is. If you need to go back, definitely do that. So commercial switches make it possible to connect different types of networks, that is Ethernet, Fiber Channel, Rapid IO, ATM, others that I've never heard of, and of course the popular 802.11 Wi-Fi networks. This connectivity can be at any of the layers in the OSI model. Now, while the layer 2 functionality is adequate for bandwidth shifting within one technology, interconnecting technologies such as Ethernet and Token Ring are performed more easily at layer 3. Devices that interconnect at the layer 3 are traditionally called routers, so layer 3 switches can also be regarded as relatively primitive and specialized routers. 
and I'm sure there's pros and cons to um, combining the two. But right here, I since I'm talking so much about the OSI model, I want you to take a trip down memory lane and tell me what a good acronym is in order to remember these layers of the OSI model. I'll tell you my favorite one is please do not teach students pointless acronyms. So where there is a need for a great deal of analysis of network performance and security, switches may be connected to WAN routers as places for analytical modules. So some vendors provide firewall, network intrusion detection, and performance analysis modules that can plug into switch ports. So that's really fascinating, and you can tell right here we're going into the security part of the lesson. And so we're going from the concept of switches and LANs to switches and WANs. And that's why I ask you, what does WAN stand for? Through port mirroring, a switch can create a mirror image of data that can go to an external device, such as intrusion detection systems and packet sniffers. You obviously wouldn't want a mirror of your data going to a bad guy or a hacker to invade your privacy but setting up a mirror for the sake of stopping those guys is a good idea. So write out your thoughts. Why would anyone want to use port mirroring? And use that word in your reply, port mirroring. And here's a great Eli 5, or explain it to me like I'm 5, explanation of what port mirroring is. It says here that flow taps are different in that they're designed to physically siphon a copy of the photons out of a fiber optic cable via a prism and send a copy to somewhere else, usually a flow analyzer. So if we're talking about port mirroring using fiber optic cable, we're talking about a literal mirror. And these are called flow taps. And then another Eli 5 in terms of why we need port mirroring in the first place. It says you might want to capture the traffic upstream from a host so that a server's NIC might discard Ethernet frames that are faulty. That is, it, they're incomplete or there was a bad checksum. You know, packets are dropped. We talk about this all the time. So before you could even see them on the host, by grabbing a copy of the traffic, you can show everything even things that a normal NIC would filter out as being not worth seeing. So wow, port mirroring helps with in terms of reliability. Another cool possibility with switches is a switch can carry power. We call this power over Ethernet. This would avoid the need to attach devices such as a VOIP phone or wireless access point uh, to have a Another really cool possibility switches give us is this idea called power over Ethernet. You may have seen this before where you don't need to plug something in to an outlet. You could just plug it into the Ethernet cable itself and that will give it that tiny bit of electricity it needs and you're good to go from there. We could be talking about just plugging in a phone or plugging in a wireless access point. All the power it would need would be coming from this Ethernet switch which is pretty cool. And I did a little deep dive into this concept and found a really nice chart here. You can kind of look at it yourself. You're seeing some examples of positive voltage and negative voltage. That's definitely for a whole nother <laughs> lesson. But something I forgot in the list of things you can plug in without a power cable, um, that would be security cameras. You probably see them around my classroom. They just need a tiny bit of power in order to transmit the video to a database. So it looks like here in different scenarios, different wires are carrying voltage that the device can use. And anytime you see uh, RX and TX, that usually stands for transfer or receive. So the best explanation I found in terms of why you'd go with a switch over a router, it says a switch connects network hosts, that's like computers, to each other on the same network, and a router connects networks together. So if you use a router to connect your home network to the internet, but it only has four ports on it, and you want to connect seven hosts to your home computer or your home network, you would want to get a switch. You would connect the router to it, of course, and then anything else you plug into the switch can connect over the router. So what am I saying here? In college, all my buddies would get together and play Age of Empires, and the best way to do that is by connecting to each other through a switch, not just trying to find each other on the internet and then deal with lag. And geez, I've been using this since I was in third grade when my brother and I would connect and play Doom. Back then, we didn't even have the internet. We would just connect and play what was called a deathmatch in the original Doom game. 
So at the end of the day, I'm saying you want to switch because there's no replacement for the joy you'll receive when you're playing in a LAN party. However, I already feel kind of silly because technology has gotten so much better that when I'm playing Crucible on Destiny, I rarely have connectivity problems. Just in case you had never heard of Age of Empires, it's probably the greatest game ever created. So I'd like to briefly talk about level 4 and 7 switches. While the exact meaning of the term layer 4 switch is uh, vendor dependent, that means whatever company created it will define what it means by layer 4. It almost always starts with a capability for network address translation, aka NAT. And then the switch can add some type of load distribution. You know, we talked about load balancers. So it can add some type of load distribution based on TCP sessions. The device may include a stateful firewall as well. So that's a pretty nifty switch right there. It may also have a VPN, so for the paranoid out there, or be an IPsec security gateway. And anytime you see that word gateway, I just want you to think router, at least for the sake of this class. So moving on to a layer 7 switch, these distribute loads based on uniform resource locators. You know them as URLs. They may also distribute the load by using some installation specific technique to recognize the application transactions that are going on. And a layer 7 switch may include a web cache and participate in a content delivery network. So now I'm thinking specifically of a switch that would help transmit videos to different clients. Almost done here, let me end by talking about configuration. So an unmanaged switch has no configuration. There's not even an inter interface for you to go to to click any options, so it's just strictly plug and play. These are typically the least expensive switch, obviously, and therefore they're great for the small office or uh, home environment. Which, as I think about it, it's kind of sad because if, uh, from a security standpoint, the small businesses are the ones that can least afford a security breach. So these unmanaged switches can be desktop or rack mounted. Managed switches are ones that have one or more methods to modify the operation of the switch. So common managements include, so common management methods could include a command line interface, maybe a connection through Telnet or SSH, Remember, Telnet is really old and insecure and just should not be used. The way I remember what port Telnet is, is through my favorite basketball player, Michael Jordan. I mean, Telnet is on port 23. Jordan was 23. He's pretty old and not being used to win any championships anymore. Another method would include an embedded SNMP agent, which allows the management from a remote console or management station. So this is similar to just sending like an email to the switch, or at least that's how I remember SNMP because it's similar to SMTP. And the last one is just a web interface. I think this is the one that seems most common to me. At least any time I've changed any configurations in a switch, I've used this web interface. And that's through my web browser. So your think right share, how do people communicate with switches? What are some of the options? So once you begin the communication, here are some of the things you can do. You can turn particular ports on or off. I always like to tell people this is the way to make sure your network is secure. It's not the most efficient way to make sure your network's secure, but you can go in there and turn every port off except the ones you want to use, and you can monitor those. But I'm talking like this would just be good for somebody at an apartment or maybe like their home if they don't have a large family. But that's one way to ensure security on your network. Another option is you can link bandwidth and duplex settings. Uh, priority settings for certain ports can be established. You can go through some IP management by IP clustering. MAC filtering would probably be one of the most common options used. You could specifically say what computers are allowed on your network. And the last one would be the use of a spanning tree protocol and shortest path bridging protocol. So, what is the most effective configuration option to implement in order to ensure security? So here's some configuration options. Here's some more configuration options. I'll, I'll let you just read those because this is just for fun right there. And that's the end of the lesson. So think about this lesson. Which one of these IB attributes would you say connects to the concept of switches or knowing about switches? 
And here's your DOL. In addition to Ethernet, Fiber Channel, all the other ones we talked about, you can also think of the many types of layers a switch can be on. So basically, one through four, and then seven. Most of these types of switches can have the same security features added to them, so your job is to tell me what features can be implemented and how those features will protect a network. So in other words, what can a switch provide you in terms of security? And here's your extension activity. I have a series of videos called RFCs for Fun, where I read the really technical document and then provide pictures and comments and questions alongside it. If you want an extension, go find this RFC 2613. It's uh, about switch monitoring. Read this RFC, report back to me what you found, and if you need some guidance here, um, maybe report back to me with uh, questions about the stuff you read, or give me an opinion on something you read about, or just summarize as many of these mini paragraphs as you can. And I thought it's ironic to do such a activity for an extension because I'm requesting you to comment on an RFC, and the word RFC stands for Request for Comments. Remember, if you laugh at my jokes, you get extra credit.